second lecture. And in our last lecture, the third of this series, we took up the nuclear ground burst. This covered both surface and underground shots, which produced the same basic outputs as the air burst, but in which the operation and effects of these outputs are modified. Today, we deal with the water burst. By definition, this category starts with any burst low enough for the fireball to touch the water's surface. It includes any lower burst on or under the surface of the water. This definition makes a clear distinction between the lowest air burst and the highest water burst. A distinction which is useful, but has no real existence in fact, since both bursts are practically in the same place. As the burst center is lowered down to and then under the surface of the water, the weapon's effects shift gradually away from those of a typical air burst to those of a typical water burst. During the transition, they belong in varying degrees to both categories. We'll begin our study of the water burst with a look at the gross physical effects of the explosion, the way it moves the water, as a sort of parallel to our study of earth movement and crater formation in the ground burst lecture. For the first sample, we'll consider a bomb burst at or a trifle above the surface of fairly deep water. When the bomb is detonated, the expanding sphere of hot gases depresses the water beneath it into a bowl-shaped depression. A shock wave is immediately propelled outward through the air from the burst, at the same time that a shock wave traveling almost four times as fast propagates out through the water. Simultaneously, a train of surface waves propagates outward from the disturbed area. The Pacific Proving Grounds in the Marshall Islands is the only site in which we've actually fired any surface water shots. These shots inside the lagoons have been of such very high yield that they have to be considered as shots in relatively very shallow water. So they amount to special cases of the surface burst. Shallow water is defined as any depth at which the presence of the bottom significantly modifies the effects phenomena being considered. Another special circumstance was that the islands and reefs surrounding the lagoons limited our studies of longer range surface waves and underwater pressure effects. For these reasons, our data on deep water surface bursts are the results of extrapolation rather than direct measurement. Waves that we did observe in the lagoons have conformed to theory by increasing in height when moving from deeper to shallower water, or from open water into narrows. But a number of anomalies of timing and amplitude remain to be explained. Our first underwater test shot was the Bikini Baker shot, a 20 kiloton weapon detonated 90 feet below the surface in water 180 feet deep, which again must be considered as essentially a shallow water burst. The underwater fireball broached the surface within milliseconds with almost no visible luminosity. An estimated million tons of water shot up nearly a mile and a half in the air in the form of a hollow column with a diameter approaching 2,000 feet and walls possibly 300 feet thick. Simultaneously, a surface wave, perhaps 100 feet high, was thrown out, followed by a train of other waves as the disturbance expanded. As the column fell back, there developed on the surface, at the base of the column, a large donut-shaped cloud of dense mist. The mist maintained its donut shape as it expanded outward, traveling a mile and a half in the first three minutes. This was the base surge. It paralleled in cause and behavior the base surge of dust particles, 
which falls back and rolls out from the dirt column of an underground burst. Further specialized water burst information was derived from an operation on which a device of approximately the same yield range as the Bikini Baker shot was detonated some 2,000 feet under the surface of water 16,000 feet deep. Because of the obvious military applications of an underwater burst, instrumentation on this shot included submerged targets, which could accurately duplicate the structural responses of fleet-type submarine hulls. The shot can be classified as a deep underwater shot in very deep water. It was, in a sense, a laboratory experiment, since it was fired at such a great depth in order to get approximately free field data. That is, with a minimum of interference from surface and bottom reflections of the underwater shock front. Detonation of a nuclear weapon at a great depth underwater produces a huge bubble of extremely hot gases, primarily steam and disassociated water. The bubble expands violently, sending out a shock or pressure wave. Expansion is so rapid that the bubble enlarges beyond the size where water and gas pressures would be in equilibrium. Since the water pressure now exceeds the gas pressure, it begins to reverse the action and recompress the bubble. Before its momentum is expended, the inrushing water squeezes the bubble down past the equilibrium point. Once more, gas pressure is greater than water pressure and the bubble begins to expand again. There may be several of these cycles as the bubble is borne upward by its own buoyancy. And each pulsation can cause a separate pressure wave to be emitted. In actuality, the bubble does not rise in the shape of a simple sphere, but is considerably distorted during portions of its travel. We'll change now to an upstairs viewpoint. When the primary pressure wave from a burst hits the water surface, a complex reaction takes place, throwing a blanket of spray into the air. This is called the spray dome. If there is a succeeding pressure wave from another pulsation of the bubble, it can create another spray dome effect, merging with the first one. If the forces acting on the rising bubble succeed in breaking it up, while it is still under the water, the resulting smaller bubbles will vent through the spray dome at the surface with extreme turbulence, probably in the form of ragged plumes. We can say almost axiomatically, the more the bubble disintegrates, the less there will be in the way of waves. In the very different situation, where the bubble reaches the surface and vents, while still comparatively intact and near its maximum expansion, a considerable column will be projected into the air. This column is considered to result from a jetting up of water, which rushes into the bubble crater as the gases escape. On the actual firing of a deep underwater burst, some of the phenomena we observed are not as fully understood as we'd like them to be. However, the results are roughly typical of any such detonation deep under the surface of very deep water. The first noticeable result, a fraction of a second after the firing, was the arrival of the primary shock wave, raising a spray dome over 100 feet above the surface. A couple of seconds later, another spray dome, accompanied by high individual spikes, came from the first bubble pulse. We don't know what condition the bubble was in when it vented at the surface, a dozen seconds after the explosion. But it produced a major plume formation about a quarter of a mile high. One of the later plumes reached perhaps half that height. The collapse of the plumes created a base surge, which ultimately reached almost a mile from zero. A train of waves was led by a well-defined breaking wave, which was first observed coming out of the base surge at about one minute. We can note here that the size of the base surge from any underwater burst 
will depend on the amount of water lifted into the air in plume or column formations, while wave size is related to the emergence and collapse of the cavity or bubble. The amount of water lifted is roughly predictable for shallow bursts. But for deep bursts, neither the column size nor the condition of the bubble when it vents can be exactly predicted. It follows then that we can't predict very closely the dimensions of either the base surge or the waves that a particular deep burst will produce. The closest we can come to a general rule is that for deep water, the largest base surge and wave heights will be produced in the case where the bubble reaches the surface and vents somewhat before the time of its first and greatest expansion. A shallower or deeper burst would reduce these effects. For one kiloton, the depth of burst producing maximum results will be in the neighborhood of 200 feet. For other yields, this optimum depth will of course vary. Our manual, Capabilities of Atomic Weapons, gives curves for base surge radius versus yield for various burst depth. Another set plots the surge radius against time for a deep one kiloton burst and for a shallower burst which vents near the first bubble maximum. From these, we can extrapolate with usable accuracy for field purposes. Another set of curves plots maximum wave height against range from zero for a one kiloton burst in a number of orientations. The burst at optimum depth in deep water makes waves almost twice as high as would be produced by the same shot fired at the surface. In relatively shallow water, however, wave heights are not only reduced, but become practically independent of burst depth. In the category of general information, note that the height of the highest wave in a series at a given range from a water burst zero will vary about as the square root of the yield. In other words, quadrupling the yield would about double the size of the highest wave, keeping the burst at the same scale depth, of course. Also, the height of the single highest wave of the series will decrease linearly with distance from zero, which means that the highest wave will be only half as high when the distance from zero is doubled. The physical importance of waves will, of course, vary with the shot yield and with its proximity to vulnerable targets. The 20 kiloton Bikini Baker shot, fired at mid-depth of shallow water, sent waves up to seven feet high onto a shoaling beach about three and a half miles away. A very high yield surface shot in the same shallow lagoon sent water five feet deep over an island 12 and a half miles away, eight feet deep over another at 12 miles, and 10 feet deep over one at 17 miles all of which are beyond the radius of strong blast effects. The deep underwater shot produced waves with an amplitude near 40 feet at a full mile from surface zero. While harmless to ships at even moderate ranges, waves of these magnitudes could be damaging to exposed harbor or coastal installations. It is evident that the waves from megaton weapons detonated on or in deep water could have serious implications at substantial distances, starting as they would from surface zero with a breaking wave height on the order of a thousand feet. An obvious result of a water burst in sufficiently shallow water is the formation of a bottom crater. The 20 kiloton Bikini Baker shot at mid-depth of the lagoon scooped a saucer-like depression in the bottom, almost a thousand feet across and over 20 feet deep at the center, removing an estimated three and one half million cubic yards of bottom material, of which more than half settled back into the crater. This resettling effect gives us craters with the same true bottoms and shallower apparent bottoms 
that we found typical of underground bursts. Multi-megaton bursts on the surface of the lagoon water, almost 200 feet deep, produced large bottom craters. Craters with diameters in excess of 1,500 feet and apparent depths on the order of 100 feet. As a generalization, we can consider that in the case of shallow bursts, the water can have a blanketing effect in either of two ways. As a protective blanket to decrease the cratering from surface shots, or as a confining blanket to increase the cratering from shots near the bottom. The manual gives curves for approximating crater depths and diameters for either surface or bottom bursts in water up to 200 feet deep. And a further set of curves for the heights of the crater lips produced by such bursts. The crater lips will probably not be high enough to be of any particular consequence in the sense of obstructing navigation, except in the case of very high yield detonations or in waterways which are already marginally shallow. Now we'll take up the subject of blast pressures. We've already noted that a burst at or near the water surface sends a shock wave expanding outward through both air and water. Now the characteristics of the shock wave in the air will be the same as for a surface burst over land, which we studied in connection with the ground burst lecture. Below the surface, in depths which are relatively very shallow, the peak underwater pressure will be of the same order as the air blast pressure on the water surface. In deeper water, the water transmitted pressure becomes greater than that which results from air blast on the surface. In either case, we find that with this surface burst position, little of the bomb's energy is absorbed in the water compared to the amount escaping into the air. Lowering the burst to an underwater position will reverse this situation and greatly increase the amount of shock energy transmitted directly to the water while the air blast effect above the water will be very materially reduced. This reduction parallels the air blast reduction that is characteristic of shots underground, so that the same curve from the manual can be applied to either underground or underwater shots at shallow depths for calculation of air overpressure versus range along the surface. Air overpressures above the surface do not fit this curve and will require separate calculations. Pressure waves in the water itself from either a surface shot or an underwater shot can reflect from the bottom and even be reinforced by underwater mock stem formations similar to those in air. Pressure waves can also reflect from the water surface above but in reversed form as rarefaction waves which will cause a cancellation effect that shortens the duration of the pressure wave near the surface at longer ranges from zero. Other factors being the same, peak underwater pressures at a given distance will vary as the cube root of the burst yield. Because water is nearly incompressible, it transmits pressure waves with great efficiency. A deep underwater burst may produce peak water pressures on the order of several hundred times as great as the overpressures of an air burst of the same yield would produce in the air at the same range. Conversely, the same overpressure level will have a far greater range from a deep burst than from an equal air burst. These directly transmitted underwater pressures do not have a monopoly on ship damaging effects. In water of moderate depth, pressures reflected from the bottom although of lesser magnitude, may cause major damage because of the upward component in the shock's orientation or direction of attack. These and other more complex factors are reflected in the manual's curves, which plot range for severe damage to ships against height and depth of burst. Note that a burst at sufficient depth has a severe damage range approximately twice as great as the same weapon fired at the surface would have. Other curves are available, which plot depth of burst against horizontal range for lethal hull damage to submarines.
Note that the lethal range is comparatively short for bursts near the surface, but increases rapidly for bursts at greater depth. Also, as the depth of the target submarine is increased, the lethal range for a given burst will increase substantially. In brief, then, for any underwater burst, both depth of burst and depth of target will affect the range of damage, whether the target is a submarine or the upstream face of a dam. Our next major subject is that of thermal radiation. Treatment of thermal effects of water surface burst is simplified by their essential identity with thermal effects from a ground surface burst. In either case, interaction of the fireball with the surface will considerably reduce the thermal energy reaching surface targets from what it would be from an equal air burst. The same curve in the manual will apply to both ground surface and water surface bursts for calculations of thermal energy versus range. Bursts located under the water are still easier to deal with. The fireball is so obscured, even at comparatively shallow burst depths, that the thermal effects on surface targets can be considered as negligible. Our next subject will be nuclear radiation. In our last lecture, we noted that a ground surface burst will have almost as great a range with a given initial radiation dosage as an air burst to the same yield would have. This is equally true when the surface burst is on water. Therefore, we can use the same curves in the manual for approximating initial radiation dosage versus slant range for the air burst, ground surface burst, or water surface burst. This convenient situation changes if we center the burst under the water surface or ground surface. Such a lowering to even relatively shallow depths will reduce the initial radiation dosage on surface targets to a minor percentage of what the air burst would give at the same range. The reduction is roughly the same for either the underground or underwater position. So again, a single scaling curve will fit both. Any greater burst depth will, of course, very quickly reduce the initial radiation to a negligible level. Now, when we come to residual radiation, we run into some aspects where the water burst shows less resemblance to the ground burst. The main variable here is the depth of water. In relatively shallow water, either a surface or underwater burst can dig a substantial crater and vaporize and carry a significant amount of bottom material up with the cloud. The resulting fallout can be heavy approaching as a maximum the intensities and area contours we would get from ground surface bursts. The water burst involving quantities of bottom material will normally produce a distribution of the available radioactive contaminant that differs so slightly from the pattern the ground burst would lay down that the difference will be mainly of academic interest, less important than the other unknowns and variables that we have to deal with in this field. The Bikini Baker shot was our first actual experience with contamination from a shallow water detonation. Information which could apply to coastal or harbor bursts in general was derived from a number of ships which were anchored in the lagoon for exposure to the effects of this shot. Much of the contamination which fell on ships was washed off by the considerable quantities of water which also fell on them because of their closeness to zero. In addition, Contamination which fell near the ships was quickly mixed and diluted in the lagoon water instead of lying exposed and active on the surface, as would have been the case on land. Considering all factors, the dose rates on board ships in this situation were estimated to be only one quarter of what they would have been on adjacent land areas at the same relative position. A variation on this situation occurs where fallout from a shallow water burst is deposited on ships which are relatively much further away from zero. In such cases, where no visible quantities of water come down with the contaminant, the contaminant is not washed overside, and radiation levels on deck are consequently higher than when they were washed off. 
A need to protect the crews of naval vessels from residual radiation was obvious. It led to experiments with piping and sprinkler heads to produce a man-made rain for the purpose of washing contamination into the sea before it could reach and adhere to the decks and weather surfaces of ships. Tests conducted in the Pacific Proving Grounds during some heavy fallout periods showed that such washdown equipment can reduce shipboard radiation levels to a degree that practically eliminates any major hazard to crews from this source. So far in this section, we've noted that nuclear bursts in or on relatively shallow water can produce a heavy fallout, very similar to the fallout from a ground surface burst. The factor governing the magnitude of the fallout from such a water burst is the degree of involvement of the fireball with the material at the bottom. When we come to bursts on or under the surface of deep water, where the fireball makes no contact with the bottom, the picture reverses 180 degrees, so to speak. The local fallout from such a burst is expected to be somewhat greater than in the case of an air burst, but still a comparatively negligible quantity. This is because the water in any resulting cloud does such an inefficient job of scavenging and transporting radioactive fission products compared to the job done by the vaporized earth from a ground or shallow water burst. For the same reason, very little radioactivity is trapped in the base surge from any burst in deep water. And no substantial contamination can result from such a base surge. That winds up about as much of the water burst story as we can handle here, and leaves us time for a brief review. We've seen that a nuclear surface burst will blow a bowl or crater into the water, propel a shock wave out through both air and water, and set up a train of surface waves radiating out from zero. The air overpressures and in relatively shallow water, the overpressures below the surface will be effectively the same as from an equivalent ground surface burst and will follow the same scaling curves. Thermal and initial nuclear radiation effects on surface targets will also be the same as for a ground surface burst. When the burst center is lowered to a position shallowly under the water, as in the case of the Bikini Baker shot, much more water comparatively is thrown into the air, and a base surge is created when the water column collapses back to the surface. If the water itself is relatively shallow, again like the Baker shot, surface wave height is essentially independent of the depth of the burst. In deep water, wave height increases moderately with increased burst depth, but only up to an optimum point, after which any greater burst depth produces smaller waves. Another effect of lowering the burst to an underwater position is to increase greatly the energy coupled to the water, so that shock overpressures in the water are greatly increased. Overpressures in the air, as well as thermal and initial nuclear radiation effects on surface targets, are much more attenuated, following roughly the same scaling curves that are used for underground bursts. A nuclear burst in or on relatively shallow water can also dig a crater in the bottom, providing that the burst center is not more than about half a fireball radius above the bottom. As a standard, to give us some size comparisons, we use a normal crater from a ground surface burst. The crater from a moderately shallow water surface burst of similar yield will be roughly of the same diameter, but much less in depth. If the burst is on the bottom, however, the crater will be several times greater in both diameter and depth. The water blanket confines the explosion to make it excavate more efficiently. From the residual contamination standpoint, a water burst will cause a significant local fallout and contaminated base surge only 
if a substantial amount of bottom material is taken up and vaporized in the fireball. Therefore, only shallow water bursts will cause important fallout, which may at maximum approach the dimensions and intensities of the fallout we'd expect from an equal ground surface burst. In line with this concept, the burst in deep water produced no significant fallout. Because it was a very deep burst, air blast and thermal and initial nuclear radiation effects were also negligible. Such a deep burst in deep water, however, does create very high underwater pressures, which have a far greater range than equal overpressures in the air would have, and which consequently have a large military potential. The huge underwater bubble may shrink and expand again several times on its way to the surface, with each pulsation sending out another shock wave. When the underwater shock wave reaches the surface, a complex reaction drives so-called spray domes into the air. When the bubble itself finally vents at the surface, it produces plume formations with dimensions which will largely depend on the condition of the bubble at that time. The surface waves appear at this time. In deep water, their maximum crest heights, like those of the waves from any other water burst, will show an approximately linear decrease with distance. Upon reaching shallower or narrower water, the waves will increase in height. But they will break and lose this height when the water shoals to a depth on the order of the wave height itself. As a useful generalization, we can consider that for deep water, the largest base surge and wave heights will be produced in the case where the bubble reaches the surface and vents somewhat before the time of its first and greatest expansion. Any shallower or deeper burst will reduce these effects. That winds up our treatment of the water burst. And at this point, we seem to have run out of time. That's all for today. <laughs>